So um, thank you all very much for having me back. I've done this a couple years ago, and it really is a very fun topic to talk about, to educate, because this community of the Parkinson's patients actually challenges me to keep learning more, because you guys know so much, and you bring out new research to me, so I keep learning as we do these talks. So, um, you know, if I, you can't hear me if I walk away from the microphone, please say something. I get a little animated as I do these. I am Jody Abrams. I'm a neuro-ophthalmologist, oculoplastic surgeon here in town, mainly at Sarasota Retina Institute, um, doing both coverage for some other practices. Been here for 11 years. Uh, we love living in Sarasota. We're very happy. Um, you know, have a family, a very active in the community. Uh, and I've been very fortunate that both my wife and I have been involved with NeuroChallenge. Um, myself on the medical advisory board, my wife uh, helping with the gala in the past, um, and fundraising, and we think it's such a big, important part. And I practiced before in Tennessee, and we didn't have anything like this. And this organization, when I came down, and we met with Sutherland, and we were very fortunate to learn about it, the difference in patient quality of life here because of institutions like NeuroChallenge is dramatically different. So we're very thankful for it. So, what is a neuro-ophthalmologist? Most people in this world have no idea that we even exist. Um, a neuro-ophthalmologist is either, either a neurologist or an ophthalmologist that after all the years of residency, you've gone through med school, you've done all your training, you say, I want to suffer some more, and you're going to do a fellowship. It's usually a one-year fellowship, and what you're learning about is how the eye and the brain relate. And we come at that a little bit differently, whether your background is training in ophthalmology or neurology, but it's still the same idea visual functional pathway from the front of the eye all the way to the back of the brain where we see and how does that relate. And it's a rare specialty. There's only about four to 500 of us in the country. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have myself uh, and my partner, Dr. Mark Levy here, um, who's been a neuro-ophthalmologist in the town for over 30 years. So uh, we're very happy to help out with that. So these include problems with the eye muscles, double vision issues, the optic nerve, uh, blurred vision that are not normal causes. So you don't come see me for glasses, you don't come see me for cataracts, you come to see me when things don't make sense normally, when the normal workups, the normal kind of evaluations, the neurological issues come out, that's when you're coming to see us. I have friends that come up and say, I'm gonna come see you in the office now. You don't wanna see me, you wanna see somebody who's more qualified for the general stuff, but when you have the rare stuff, the spasms that we'll talk about, the double vision that we'll talk about, that's when you need to come see our office. Uh, so there are many, many problems that can be seen in the eyes that are related to Parkinson's. And it's also that go along with just aging. Um, these can vary from issues like dry eyes, spasms of the eyelids, visual distortions. While most are not sight threat, these aren't diseases like retinal detachments, macular degenerations. They can be just as debilitating. If you have a problem squeezing your eyes, and your eyes are closed all the time, I don't care how good your retina's working, how good your optic nerve is, you still can't see can't get around a function. Same thing with double vision. So we're going to talk about a few of the diseases and hopefully have some time at the end to ask questions. Um, but the, one of the more common things I see in the Parkinson's population is blepharospasms. And this is when the eyelids are kind of squeezing really tight. Um, oftentimes if you're trying to put a drop in your eye, um, you'll get that squeezing effect. And it's not that the person's scared, it's just a natural reflex of it. And it's kind of amplified with Parkinson's. But oftentimes we'll get just these spasms throughout the day. And you might look at yourself or your loved one who has the disease and say, you know, when you open your eyes, they're just squeezing really, really tight. This isn't just kind of the gentle closing of the eye, they're tired, they're bored listening to you. These are actually forceful closures of the eyes. There is a muscle that surrounds our eye called the orbicularis, and that's what's spasming and closing. And they're blinking with a lot of force. And hopefully you guys can see the pictures up here. That's what it's looked like. It's not just a normal eyelid closure. And this can happen randomly throughout the day, rapidly, and it can be very difficult to open and see if you can get around. So you can imagine this is really, really irritating. But the good news is there's been a treatment that's been out since the 90s, and it's really effective, and that's Botox. So we've all heard about Botox, and it's a really interesting drug that has a really cool history. It was brought out in the late 1970s by an ophthalmologist out of California, Dr. Alan Scott. And when Dr. Scott invented Botox, he said, you know, there's two things I want to figure out how to do this for. Spasms of the face, blood for spasms, semifacial spasms, anything that's causing the contraction. And then also crossed eyes, double vision, usually in children or adults who may have little strokes with their eye muscles. And he would, we would inject it in there, and it weakens the muscle, and 
you know, help improve. So wonderful, but as you can imagine, that's somewhat of a limited group. So Ellen had that and brought it out. He's marketing it under an octoline, I think was the name of it at the time. So then he says, you know, hey, I've done well. Allergan comes up and says, we'll buy this drug from you. Four million dollars. Great, I'll sell it to you. 1991, I think he sold it. The next year, a husband and wife team out of Canada, one was a dermatologist, one was an ophthalmologist, publishes a paper that says it works for cosmetics. So they said, if you look at somebody who had spasms on one side, the wrinkles are much better, and the other side that doesn't have the injections, the wrinkles are worse, it smooths it out. Well, as we all know, we've all heard of Botox and movie stars and the cosmetic line, and it went from a $4 million drug that he sold to over a billion dollar a year industry for the drug, and he's often said he probably should have held up to it a little bit longer. <laughs> um, so that's where the legend, and Botox really is a drug that just continues to be expanded on uh, we use it for blood risk spasms and eye muscle uh, depth deviation quite a bit in our practice. Um, we're not really into the cosmetic world, but we also use it for migraines, and it works really well. And there was a Time, article, uh, Time Magazine article a couple years ago that just looked at everything it's used for, spasms, uh, urinary issues, vocal cord dysphonias. Botox we injected pretty much everywhere, even sweating under the armpits or the hands it can be used for, and it's actually FDA approved for them. So Botox, or one of the toxins, there's a couple of new ones out, are really the preferred treatment for blepharospasms. How does it work? What it does is actually it blocks the nerve muscle junction. And if you can see on the screen at the very top is, the, is a motor nerve going, and it's going to affect the blue area at the bottom, which is the muscle. And it's going to say, okay, you need to work, contract. And it releases some uh, acetylcholine, and the receptors on the muscle say, okay, we're going to start contracting. Botox actually goes in there and blocks that signal, so it stops it from knowing how to retract. It's a nice drug that can last three to four months. The great thing about Botox is if you inject it and say it doesn't work or causes a problem, or maybe the eyelids don't open, and that's a problem, or if we're doing double vision, it gives too much uh, relaxing of the muscles and you get worse double vision. It only lasts about three to four months. It's a great drug that it's pretty safe. You, you know, you can wait it out and it will the bad part about Botox is, if it does work, it only lasts three to four months, so you do have to repeat it. Uh, prior to Botox, we really had to do some big surgeries for this. We would go in and strip out the muscles around the eye, you get a lot of dryness, disfigurement. It was a very, very difficult surgery to do for both physician and patient. So this changed the mechanism and the way we treat these patients. The injections are done on both upper and lower eyelids. Everybody has a little bit different variation and different doses. I like to start really low and tell patients, you know, you might not get a whole lot the first time. I can add some more in next time, but what I don't want is your eyelid not to open at all or to not be able to blink. So injections are done in the office, off in the same chair that we're sitting in, and you know, it's a very, very tiny needle. Most patients say it's really minimal pain. And what shows me it works is the patients keep coming back. They're not coming back because they look better and prettier or whatnot. They're coming back because it helps keep their eyelids and makes a difference in their lives. So here's a patient with blood spasm and post-treatment with Botox. You can see much better and her eyes open normally. Blood spasms is one of the more common things we see, but we also see just normal eye changes, droopy eyelids, whether it be the skin, whether it be the muscle. And the question is, is that from aging? Is it from Parkinson's? And you can debate that. It's probably a combination of multiple things. But it can be treated. It can be something that helps. When we're talking about this, once again, we're not trying to make people look uh, younger, prettier, or anything else like that. We're trying to get your vision, your, your vision to improve. And what people come in and say is, well, I don't know if my eyelids bother me. Okay, very easy test. Next time you're watching TV, grab your eyelids and do this. Just lift them up gently. If you say, wow, I didn't realize how bright the room was. I didn't realize there was dust on the fans up top. I didn't realize how much I'm missing of the world. That's when it's a functional reason to remove, uh, to lift the eyelids. And it's, once again, if you're just saying, hey, I don't like the way it looks, that's a different thing. You need to go see one of the cosmetic surgeons in town and they'll do great. But for this, we're talking functional that is covered by insurance. And it can make a big difference. It improves light coming in. Your contrast sensitivity improves. Your peripheral vision improves. All these are very important as we're walking around the world. Uh, the main goal is to make the patient not look better, but help them see better. It's covered by most medical plans. It's functional, not cosmetic surgery. Uh, one thing in the Parkinson's population especially is we're very conservative with eyelid surgery. 
We'll talk about next the dry eyes. It's very easy with eyelid surgery to lift it up too much and then you can't blink very well. We all remember Liberace. The story was Liberace had so many eyelid surgeries, literally you'd walk in and think he was awake looking at you. The reality is he didn't close his eyes when he went to sleep. Um, so you gotta be very careful about that. You know, it's a good idea if you're gonna have eyelid surgery done for a functional, especially of a Parkinson's disease, to see somebody who's familiar with that, tell them, hey, let's be conservative. I always tell people that you can lift it up more, you can take more skin later on, hard to put it back, and when you get dry eyes, it can be very debilitating to your vision. So that'll take us two dry eyes, and this is probably one of the most common things I really do see in our Parkinson's population. And the dry eyes, the tear film is the very first thing that light hits. So when you come in between the eyelids, you hit the cornea, and sitting on the front of the cornea, the clear part of the eye, is a tear film, and it's made up of a lipid layer, a aqueous layer, a fusion layer. It's often overlooked. People think, ah, the tear film the, is not really important. I'm more worried about my cataracts. The reality is it doesn't matter how great your cataract surgeon is. It doesn't matter how good your glasses are or your retina macular degeneration might be controlled. If your tear film is messed up, the light gets broken up and nothing's going to fix it. So you've got to worry about it. Um, it's a critical layer. It's the first thing that light hits. And as you can see kind of at the bottom here, it's blurry vision from the tear film. Nothing I can do with glasses, cataracts, or anything else is going to make that better. And the big thing is not everybody notices the dry eye feeling. Everybody says, oh, my eyes aren't dry because they're not gritty. They don't burn. Yeah, those are symptoms of it, but not always. One of the symptoms that everybody forgets is watery eyes is actually a sign of dry eyes. And that's because the body's trying to produce extra tears. It can't keep up. It's getting irritation. You might not feel it, but it says, I need to get more tears. And you overproduce, and then the tears run down your face and you start thinking, oh, it's another problem, not dryness, but it's actually the most common cause of dry eye, of uh, watery eyes is dryness. So using artificial tears and those things can help. Uh, tears are spread across the eye as we blink. If that's why we're blinking all day long, to help keep moisturizing the front part of the eye. The average blinking rate is about 10 per minute. In the Parkinson's patient, we see a significant decrease of it. And one of my favorite things as I'm sitting talking to patients with Parkinson's is to point out to them and the family member, in the last five minutes you've, went, you've had like four blinks. And you're wondering why your eyes are right now. This is kind of like the Parkinson's stare that will say. And yes, if you sit there, any natural person, hold your eye open for a minute or two, it's going to start to hurt. Your start, goodness gets to start to get blurry. If you have a neurological problem that decreases your blinking, the tear film can't spread, your cornea starts to dry out, and your hurt vision can go down. Um, evaporation occurs more because you're not blinking, you're not coating the eye throughout the uh, day, and you get uh, multiple uh, symptoms with it. And this can be from the, the dry eyes, can be from the decrease in blinking, also the medications, also aging, other factors, eyelid positions can do it. What are some of the symptoms that we see with dry eyes? Well, okay, decreased vision, we've said that, burning eyes, stinging eyes, red eyes, uh, watery eyes, as I talked about, gritty feeling, even double vision, what we call monocular diplopia, monocular double vision, can be from dry eyes. Multiple ways to test for it. One of the older ways is called a Schirmer's test. They put a little device in your eyelid, walk away for a few minutes, come back and see how much tear film you're producing. Um, not used as much anymore. Different stains that we use in ophthalmology. But for anybody who's ever come to see me, we have a test called Lysamine Green. Um, I come home every day with green stuff all over my hands and jacket. My wife loves having to wash it off of uh, my clothes, but it is a great stain to look for dryness. Um, but if you see our, at, at me at the office before you leave, check the bathroom, make sure you don't have green mascara look all around your eyes. Um, there are new machines out there that test our tear films that can tell us different things about that. There's probably a need, for, uh, a use for it. We're still debating how useful and how much it changes our treatment. Um, so it depends on what your doctor has. So once it's diagnosed, there's multiple ways to treat in, uh, in combination to help with dry eyes. Usually we're going to start with something simple, artificial tears, and progress from there. And this is a great diagram I'm kind of showing you. If you look in the upper left part, we have this normal condition. And I always talk about it's a faucet. Your lacrimal glands, your other glands around produce the artificial tears. And then in the very corner of our eye is a tear duct. That, and the tear duct doesn't produce tears. It drains them into the nose. So that's kind of the drain of the sink here. And what happens is we have a decrease of the positive production, so we can improve it with artificial tears. And we'll talk about some plugs that are actually drain, uh, plugging up the sink. 
So the first thing that we're going to tell you is get a good artificial tear. There are multiple ones out there. What I tell people is get a good name brand artificial tear. I don't care if it's Sustain, Opti, Genteel, Retain, any of them. They're all very, very good. And people like different ones. Go on Amazon, go get some coupons, try different ones. The doctors usually will have samples of this. Um, and see which one you like. Everybody has a little bit different opinion of that. Stay away from the CVS brands, the Walgreens brands, the Walmart. They use older preservatives, older technology. It can cause more irritation. So if you're having to use them, you can say, hey, they do work, but I'm putting them in a lot. Then something like a non-preserved artificial tear will work. These are usually little vials. Um, if you need to use the tears more often, I say I strongly recommend using non-preserved artificial tears. How many people have problem getting the drops in their eyes? There we go. A lot of us. I, I even do. I'll give you a little trick that sometimes can work, and I learned this from my great aunt Julie years ago. She was having problems with the glaucoma drop getting in. If you're having trouble getting it in, lay down your bed, your couch, whatever surface you want to lay on. And as long as you're laying flat, looking up at the sky, gravity is pulling back. Take the bottle, balance it on the bridge of your nose, and you can squeeze it there. You don't have to try to manipulate your eyelid open and doing this and have half of it run down your cheek each time. So you can put it in the corner of your eye. Even if you close your eye, as long as you don't move your head, it's going to still go in there the instant you open your eye. Gravity's going to keep pulling it and keeping it there. So it's a little trick to try to save yourself some money and frustration. Uh, another way to do it, and these are somewhat useful, especially in our Parkinson's population, is the artificial tear spray. There's different manufacturers, they kind of come and go. This was Tears Again Advanced. I just looked last night, and actually, they're no longer making it. Another company bought them out. Um, but you can go into Amazon, artificial tear sprays. I have had spouses say they love it because if their Parkinson's patient is bothered, they walk up and spray them with that. It's, you know, and help them stop it. But it also helps her uh, to the eye drops. So be nice to each other about that. So if the artificial tears aren't working or you're having to use them a lot or you're having trouble, one of the things we can do in the office is plugging up the tear ducts. Remember, these are the drains. And you have a tear duct at the upper and lower eyelid. Uh, see those ones here, you can see this is a, what we call a cannulaculus. We have these drains over here, and they go down into the nose. So if you ever notice when you start to cry a lot, you get some tears running down your nose, or if you put a, a drop of medicine in your eyes, you can taste it. That's why it's draining into your nose, down into your gut, and going away. And we can actually close that with different types of plugs. Uh, it's something very simple to do in the office. Uh, we usually just use some topical numbing medicine. You don't even, uh, you know, it's not injections or anything. We put these little plugs in there. Some of them are plastic. The local ones I use are kind of an artificial collagen that will dissolve. You replace them every four to six months as needed, and it does work well. Um, I've had it done to myself when I had some dry eye issues, and it doesn't really hurt. It's uh, very easy. Ladies tell me it's like changing your earrings. I don't know what that feels like, but it's not something that's bad. We have other advanced medicines, uh, Restasis, Dydra, uh, uh, Sequa, these are things you'll see on TV and advertise. Um, they're great drops, they work, they take a while to uh, kind of kick in. Um, it's something you want to use later on to talk to your eye care doctor, we all are familiar with it. We have steroid drops, we haven't had non-steroidals, kind of like an ibuprofen for your eyes that do work. If that doesn't work, don't give up hope. Hey, I've used every drop out there, it's not better. Sometimes it's just changing the position of the eyelids. Maybe closing them up a little bit, maybe lifting them, tightening them. As we get older, they start to, the lower ones pull down, so we can't move the tear gum. And there's oftentimes uh, a very simple kind of outpatient and weight surgery that we can do to help positioning the eyelids and improve dryness. So that's the dry eye part of it. Now, double vision, this is something as a neuro-ophthalmologist we see quite often throughout the day. And double vision can be very bothersome in Parkinson's patients. And true double vision, is when both eyes are not focused on the same object and the brain sees two and doesn't know which one's the real one. Both are technically real, but you can't really interpret the well, uh, the world very well with that. So there's two types of double vision, and you look really, really smart if you go into your eye doctor and say, hey doc, I'm having double vision, and it's, you can tell them it's either monocular or binocular, and it changes our workups completely, so I'm gonna teach you a little bit of this. Binocular double vision, both eyes are seeing separate images. Maybe they're turned out or they're turned in, crossing one way or the other. As soon as you cover one eye, now you only have one image. And it goes away. 
the other eye, you still have one image. That's called binocular defocus. That's a misalignment of the eyes. That's either brain, muscle, tissue. If you cover one eye and you still see the double vision, that's monocular defocus. And you don't have to remember the monocular, binocular, but if you tell your eye doctor that I did that, you're gonna make them really happy because now they know which direction to go. Monocular is tear film, refractive, it's not a neurological cause, so we can kind of relax, we're not gonna use prisms for that. So, double vision can be an eye muscle weakness. <clears throat> um, as you can see here, when the patient looks at the very top over the side, you can see both eyes going the same direction. And then at the bottom one, you can see that one eye on the right doesn't go over as much. So there's a weakness of the muscle. So now the eyes are seeing two different things. The most common cause of double vision in our Parkinson's population is what we call convergence of deficiency. These patients often complain of, you know, I can't really read anymore. When I'm looking up close, things don't seem right. And a lot of times they come in and say, I just stopped reading. I love reading books. You know, I just don't, I can't look at my iPad, I can't look at my book, my phone anymore. It's just not comfortable, so I just stop it. And that's disappointing because we have a lot of patients who love reading. Um, you can notice it at distance, but it's not quite as common, it's more up close. So convergence insufficiency is when the eyes don't turn in together. To look up close, if I'm gonna look at this microphone, if I'm looking out at the distance, my eyes are straight like this. As soon as I look up at this microphone, the eyes have to turn in. So both eyes are focused on the same object. That's multiple areas of the brain that occur. They have to coordinate that. And if they don't rotate together and stay aligned together, then you can get double vision. A lot of times you might notice somebody reading and they, every time they go to read, they close one eye. Well, binocular diplopia, they're covering one eye to get rid of it so they can see up close. Um, we see convergence insufficiency in Parkinson's patients. Head traumas are very common for this. Um, and just natural aging can do it, but it's something to look at. If you say, boy, it's blurry, I can't read very well. As soon as I close one eye, it's a lot better. That's probably something in the convergence issue that let your eye doctor know about it. You know, we can treat it oftentimes with some very simple exercises. One of them is called a pencil push-up. So I always love telling my patients, hey, you're gonna do some push-ups and uh, get some weird looks. But what you're gonna do, it's an exercise that you can do without breaking a sweat. You're gonna basically take a pen, pencil, even your finger, and with your glasses on that you read, you slowly come in, looking at the tip of it, and then when you can see the blurred or double, you go back. You're gonna do about 10 times in a row, do two sets a day, you're gonna cause a headache. It's like going to the gym for the first time. Um, it gets better over time. You can re-strengthen it and help with that. Um, it does work well. Um, it's one of those nice things that we can use for our patients, and anybody can do it. If that doesn't work, we can use prism glasses. Um, you know, uh, these are bending the light, so even though your eyes are turning out, it acts like the eyes are straight. Um, what I find in our Parkinson's population is if there is a convergence or a difference between near and distance, it's really better to have two pairs of glasses, one for distance, one for near. Uh, multifocal or these progressive lenses can be very confusing sometimes, so we'll oftentimes go to two pairs. And you wear them around your neck with a leash or rookie, whatever you want to call it, and you pick up the one that you need at the time. Um, you know, this is how we would measure. If you ever come in the office, we're going to hold the kind of red and white lights in front of you and kind of measure the alignment of it. Um, and it's really important to get nice good measurements for that. Uh, you know, uh, other ones that only problems can occur, cause visual distortions. The stagnus is a rapid movement of the eyes. It's kind of like a bean that goes fast and slow, fast and slow. Um, it can make you feel like you're out seasick on a boat. Um, this can be from medications uh, you know, that can cause it. It can also be uh, neurological diseases. So it's hard sometimes to isolate out the problem. Usually we'll try to reduce medications if there's one that you're on that might be causing it, or add medications on if it's debilitating and trying to reduce it. Unfortunately, the stagnus is one of those that they're even the gurus that I talk to in our societies that are the gurus of the stagnus will say, here's a list of medications, go down the list and see which one works. That's the one you use again next time, but we can't tell you which one's exact. So don't get frustrated. There's a lot of medications you can try for that. Um, we are very fortunate, and I've been excited about this in town, and it's something I don't know of anywhere else in the country. Uh, a couple of years ago, SMH had started with a vision rehabilitation program. And I believe it was here at one time, now it's over at the main uh, hospital rehab uh, downtown. And this
this really has worked well. Uh, Eugenia and Anne Marie are the two uh, therapists I know that work well from there, and there's others. And we can send our patients, and they can do more advanced training than just the pencil push ups. Uh, they have rock strings, they have other devices, and this really can improve your visual function throughout the world. Um, it's really helped a lot of our patients. We're very fortunate for that. Uh, cataracts are not specific to Parkinson's patients, but they're very common because as we age, everybody gets cataracts. It's like everybody's going to get a wrinkle, so everybody's going to get a cataract if you get old enough. Um, you can get some acceleration of it from the medications. Um, and what a cataract is, is just a natural clouding of the lens inside of your eye. Uh, they can call it blurred vision, that's not correctable with glasses. And that's when it's time to start talking about cataract surgery. Patients often say, are my cataracts right? And my comment is, well, how's your vision? I can look at a cataract and it's, I can say it's a three plus, a four plus, a one, whatever. But the reality is, until the patient has decreased vision and vision problems, that's when it's time to do surgery. That's the criteria, not how the cataract looks, but what's the patient seeing. Um, it is the most common elective surgery done in the United States, and Florida is the king of cataract surgery. Um, we have some guys and girls out there that are amazing cataract surgeons. I mean, doing more than anywhere else in the country. It's our population, and they do very well. Um, it's a surgery that's done outpatient. Nowadays, they do them without even injecting a lot of times. They can do it topically with some drops. Um, it's not a surgery I've done in years just because of everything else I do, but I was at a surgery center the other day and one of my friends in town was doing one. It was like five or six minutes. He was in and out. Um, it's amazing. The patient wakes up and uh, goes out. They usually can see well, and it's a very uh, successful surgery. Um, the, cat, the natural lens is removed during that time. We use an ultrasound machine to break it up. There's been advertisements about laser cataract surgery. Um, educational part of that, there is lasers that can make some incisions and open the front of the lens, but you still have to use ultrasound. There is no pure laser cataract surgery out there. You still have to break the lens up in the same way. So here's just a little cartoon, and basically what we're showing, this is an insertion of the lens. This is the front of your eye, the cornea, both sides, and they insert this lens in there. And there's no nerve endings or anything, so you really aren't feeling a whole lot going on. Um, one of the big areas that I tell with my Parkinson's patients, if you see me, there's all this new advertisement for these multifocal lenses, these premium intraocular lenses, which are amazing devices to try to get people far off and up close vision without wearing glasses again. Well, one, if you wear prisms, if you ever need that, make sure you don't buy these because they are expensive and you'll still be in glasses. Two, if you have Parkinson's or any neurological disease, I kind of say, say stay away from them. You might do very well when you first get them. The problem is we know it's a progressive disease, and this is trying to cast a lot of different images on the retina, and sometimes later on it can be very difficult to see because your brain gets confused what it's seen. Dry eyes, which can progress, can make it very difficult to blur your stars. Um, these are the upgraded lenses. If you ever go to get cataract surgery, they're going to say, you know, some of them almost have like a car wash thing. Do you want the, the, the plain package? Do you want the premium package? Do you want the Supreme? You know, we're going to wax them and vacuum out the car and everything else. They're expensive. They are good lenses in the right patient. So make sure your doctor understands, hey, I have this neurological disease, Parkinson's going on. You know, what do you think? How does that fit? You can talk to them. Uh, dopamine uh, can be a problem in uh, the retina. We know that's part of the Parkinson's disease. Uh, and decreased uh, dopamine levels in the retina has been uh, theorized and talked about it causing some retinal death. Uh, this is something we're still trying to figure out. Uh, we can actually look at the cell changes on this device called an OCT, and this is something that's revolutionized all of ophthalmology. We can actually scan the back of your eyes in just about 10 to 15 seconds, looking at you down to the microns. And these are images here of the retina. Um, if you remember ever learning about rods and cones, we can actually image those. This is about 200 microns thick. We never saw this when Dr. Sutherland and I were in school. The only time we'd ever learned about this stuff was on a pathology slide. Nowadays, we can see this in the clinic. It's watching macular degeneration, cell changes, retinal changes, and other diseases. So it's really kind of changed our world of looking at it. It's good to see. Visual, visual hallucinations are something that neurologists we will see with patients with Parkinson's. Uh, about one in five have been reported with this. The number might be even higher, uh, just not reported. These visual hallucinations, luckily, are not usually threatening. It's not people coming and saying, oh my God, I'm scared, I can't go to my house. 
I'm seeing things that are attacking me. They usually, you know, report smaller people, animals, or even some loved ones who have died. Um, this isn't just exclusive to Parkinson's, of course. It can be from other uh, neurological diseases, and even from sight loss. Somebody that has decreased sight will actually start to see hallucinations. It's called, uh, uh, you know, uh, anyway, it's one uh, fancy uh, French word. I can't think of it right now. But uh, it's, you know, they, the mind basically starts to get a release. It creates images. And the nice thing is most people will realize it's not real. Uh, my favorite was my patient who said she enjoyed sitting on her front porch because it was like a movie in front of her. She'd see this cute guy in a cowboy hat walking around, and he'd fly off like Superman, and she, you know, was eight years old and just giggled about it. Um, you know, but if you do see it, it is something important to report to your doctor, especially your neurologist, because it can be related to the disease. It can be also related to medications. Uh, sleep disturbances can do it. Stress um, can increase the visual hallucination. Decreased vision, and it doesn't have to be a lot of decrease in vision. It can be 2060, which is almost driving ability. You can still have them and be a reporter. Um, medication sedatives, sleeping medication, pain meds, urinary medications can increase visual hallucinations. Uh, there are different medications that neurologists might put you on. Uh, to talk about that, it's important uh, to help with that. And then we're going to finish up here with some uh, one of the more common things that we see just in aging. And it affects all the populations out there, which is macular degeneration. And it's the most common cause of vision loss in patients over 65 years age. Uh, there's two types, it's dry and wet, if you've heard of those. The dry is just kind of a wearing down of the retina, a breakdown of the retina. The retina over time, every time it's used, it's creating little oxidative changes. And the tissue just wears out like everything else does. Um, and it just breaks down. There is no good treatment, unfortunately, for the dry type. It's slow and progressive. There are so much research money going into this because it's a big change in vision. We do recommend you using the uh, vitamins. If you look at that, the A-res vitamins. And, you know, some vitamins, as physicians, we say, yeah, who knows what it does? I don't have good studies. This one we do. There was a two giant studies funded by the government, and they said we're going to take 5,000 people and the original study was, we're going to prove the vitamins don't work. We wanted to show it doesn't help at any all with the macular degeneration. They get the data. Wow. It did help. So now it is a common recommendation to use uh, these A-reds vitamins over the counter when you have dry macular degeneration. The other type is wet. This is where the new blood vessels form. This is where you can have a sudden decrease in vision distortion. If you notice that, you need to get in touch with your eye doctor very quickly. Because there are some new treatments that we have that we can actually see and improve your vision with. Um, sorry for the gruesome picture, but this is something that we do in our retina practice all day long. Um, and this is injections. And the macular degeneration injections, from when I trained 20 years ago, they didn't exist. And basically, if you came in with what, we were going to use a laser, and I was going to tell you, I'm going to make you blind today. But I know long term that's going to be less blindness than if we don't do the laser. Hard conversation to have. Nowadays, we have these injections that we can do in the eye. And um, probably somebody in here has had this done. And we do it in the office. It takes about five minutes to do. Patients say it really isn't that uncomfortable. And we can actually improve and save their vision with wet macular degeneration. Those drugs continue to improve and we're able to help out a lot. So, um, and there's an indication that patients with uh, macular degeneration do have an increased risk of Parkinson's disease. That's been in a few studies. What do we make of that? We just watch for both diseases grow. And that's the eye. Any questions? Hopefully that cleared or answered a few topics. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So you said cataracts are great. You must know. Um, and his eye doctor, he did get the You know, this comes up every time I get a lecture about them. Did somebody get the premium lens? Well, so you asked for it. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. No, and it's, it's a good question. That I can't say it's going to be a bad thing. I definitely wouldn't say you need to go have it, the premium lenses removed. Okay. I don't. That's dangerous. I mean, they do do that. Oh, the, oh, sorry. You gave me a question. So she said her husband had cataract surgery two months ago, right. and he did go for the upgraded multifocal lens. Should she be worried about that? And the answer is. In my mind, it's probably not the best thing to have done, but it's not de totally debilitating. It's not like, oh my God, you're going to lose every vision. 
It's just be aware that as Parkinson's progresses, you need to be very cautious with the dry eyes. Dry eyes can be a big problem with multifocals. And understand that you might have some more blurriness that doesn't always correct with glasses with premium. It can be a problem. Some people, I've had patients in the past tell me with Parkinson's, hey, I've done well. I've got these premium lenses and I like them. It worked, worked well. So I mean, there's always people who kind of break my thoughts of how it is. If I have a choice, I recommend against it. But I can't say there's studies that prove that way. So no, I, I think it'll be fine if he's tolerating well. Um, but just the dry eyes are a big, big problem with a multifocal, so watch that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. The serum tears. I love serum tears. So what she's asking is drops that are made from your own blood. Uh, something I don't bring up here um, because it's a little weird, and I, but I do love them and they're great evidence for it. So what we can do is actually draw your own blood, spin out the red blood cells, and actually take the serum and you start putting in your eyes. It's not the red bloody look, it's kind of a yellow appearance, and it works really, really well. We have evidence that shows it helps regenerate the corneal nerves. Um, we use it for some other corneal neuralgias. Um, it is. It was hard to get available here in Florida for the last couple of years. It's only the last maybe three, four years that we're able to get it. They changed the rules on who could manufacture it. Um, so pharmacies had to jump through hoops. I think the eye associates do it. The blood bank in a place called Carolwood Pharmacy will do it. But they are very, very effective. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. The, there are some scleral type lenses that are for dry eyes that help kind of stop evaporative loss. Those are somewhat specialized. It's definitely something that's just harder, you know, with the Parkinson's population because of the blepharospasms, that sometimes can be very hard to get in. I mean, it's hard enough to get the drops in. Um, you got to make sure you're able to get the contacts in and out to appropriately clean them and protect the eye. So, but there are some scleral lenses that are used for that. Yes, yes. Uh, and you, you mentioned vitamins and protective for the um, for the retina, but I didn't hear which ones you said. So there, there's a couple different manufacturers, uh, Preservision, Occubite. They are all based off the same study. It's A R E D S, A R E D S. Um, I think it was an age-related eye disease study. Um, is what the name of it. And there's actually, they call it AREDS2, which is the second study with refined the vitamins a little bit. They're over the counter. All of them are based off the same uh, data. They're all pretty much the same. I think stick with a good name brand. Um, vitamins, minerals are not regulated by the FDA, so you always gotta be cautious what you're taking. And I think if you get a big name brand, they're probably more watched by consumer groups to make sure that they're absorbed and they have the correct stuff in them. Um, so either one of those, and they're available at Amazon, Walgreens, wherever else you want to go. That's it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Gotta wait for the mic. Are visual disturbances like ocular migraines associated with Parkinson's at all? Uh, I haven't seen that I would say ocular migraines are significantly increased, they increased in the population of Parkinson's patients, at least they're not relating it to me, but it's definitely something we see in patients over 50 and 60 years old. So I think the population is going in. And ocular migraines, uh, you know, when we talk about those, it's important for everybody to remember, it's a visual disturbance, usually like a bright flashing, zigzagging kind of line that can start small and expand. And the most common thing when I tell somebody they have an ocular migraine is, well, I don't have headaches, if you're wrong. Ocular migraines don't mean headaches. There's all kinds of different types of migraines. These are just visual disturbances. They usually start small, they expand, 15, 20 minutes, they're gone. And most of the time, you don't have to have a headache. Um, there are some medications we use that those get worse and disturb you, but most of the time, they're uh, not interfering with life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, my son is not a Parkinson's patient, but had other conditions for which he was prescribed medications that caused double vision. And he was told that's just something you have to live with now. My question is, is there potential therapy for that? There is stuff, depending on the cause of the diplopia. Um, if it's a misalignment in the eyes, we can use prisms. There's even eye muscle surgery that we do. Um, sometimes it's treating 
the cornea or the retina that might be causing the monocular diplopia. Um, so there's a lot of different things. I would have to see them. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's uh, double vision. It's rare that we can't do something to help with it. Now, sometimes what we suggest isn't what people want to hear. I mean, sometimes I have patients with a disease called thyroiditis disease where their eyes are scarred and they can't move and they have bad double vision. We actually occlude or block out one of the eyes. Um, that's not always the best thing, but it definitely can. It, there's a lot of things you can do for it. Yes, now, I have double vision both near and far, mm -hmm. and it's periodic. It's not continuous. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering whether that is related to the Parkinson's, or is it just age? Well, it definitely can be with the Parkinson's. I mean, I mean depending on what kind of alignment issue it is, if it's a convergence, it can be that sometimes you're able to do things a little bit better, and then sometimes your eyes wear out. If you're noticing it after reading a while, or using your eyes for a bit, but it's better in the mor uh, morning, you know, that can be the Parkinson's. There's diseases like Lysenia gravis uh, that can definitely uh, cause that too, that can be variable. Um, it also depends on if it's both eyes or just the one. If it's just the one, then a lot of times it's going to be dryness or changes in the tear sick film. Um, once again, related to Parkinson's aging, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, is there anything special about um, glaucoma and Parkinson's? Specifically, not really. That they, I mean, you know, using the drops, I think, is very somewhat difficult sometimes for patients. So I encourage my glaucoma specialist to try to pay with lasers or other therapies. Um, but a definite relationship of it, there can be some nerve loss that occurs with cell death with dopamine loss. Can I prove it? Can I say something different? No, it's just treat the glaucoma. Glaucoma is damage of the optic nerve. It's a disease that we don't understand. We know it's related to high pressure, but past that, the glaucoma specialists hate it when I say it, but it's literally like old medicine to release the evil humors. They try to drain the fluid out of the eye to keep the pressure down to help the nerve, but we don't really know what's going on with the nerve, but that's another thing we know how to treat. Um, so there is probably a combination of it, but past the pressure treating, I can't say there's a therapy that we can say different, or specifically say in the Parkinson's group. Okay, thank you. That would be our last question due to time. So thank you very much.